Um, yes. So I'm very excited to be here this afternoon uh, to talk to you about organic houseplant care. So what we're going to learn is, well, first I'm going to just do a very brief introduction to the Our Water, Our World program for those of you that are not familiar with it. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of bringing in the right plant for uh, the right place or the room, uh, the space in the house. We're going to talk a little bit about proper houseplant care. Uh, we're going to review some common mistakes we make. Then I'm going to dive into the pests of indoor plants and then management strategies and then I'll briefly review when we're using a pesticide on houseplants, some tips for success, and then keeping our houseplants happy, and then some online resources. So the Our Water, Our World program, oh gosh, I bet I have this thing. Wait, hold on a second. Pardon me. So the Our Water, Our World program, is a program that's designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality. And we partner with water pollution prevention agencies and retailers that sell pesticides. So the water pollution prevention agencies that we will, that sponsor the Our Water Our World program throughout the Sloat stores in Contra Costa, it's the Contra Costa County Clean Water Program. In San Francisco, it's the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And in Marin, it's the Marin County Stormwater Pollution Prevention Program. So uh, that's just an example of the many uh, pollution prevention agencies that sponsor uh, the Our Water Our World program throughout the state of California. And we are a integrated pest management educational program for the public. So all of our information is education for you to help you solve your pest problems with the less toxic approach. You can find our materials, retailers, as well as the Our Water, Our World website, which is ourwaterourworld.org. Okay, so let's talk about some house plants. So when we talk about IPM outside in the garden, we're all, one of the really important parts of choosing plants is always putting the right plant in the right place so that it can really grow to um, its perfection without stress. So inside the house, it's a little different. Understanding that plants that we bring inside, plants that we consider indoor plants are typically tropical plants, indoor tropicals. And they, we've, we have found that they can grow very well inside. And we have found that we can get all those wonderful benefits of plants uh, from this, this category of, um, of indoor tropicals. But some things that we want to keep in mind uh, and really be aware of is our light exposure. Uh, is it bright light? Is it low light? And um, as Jen has mentioned in a past houseplant webinar, which I highly encourage everyone to watch if they haven't already, is understanding um, how strong light really can be when it's sunlight is coming straight through the glass of a window. So we really want to understand light exposure and make sure we are matching the light exposure to uh, the plants that can handle that light exposure. We also want to keep in mind room temperatures. These are indoor tropical plants, or I should say these are plants that are typically coming from tropical areas. So uh, the room temperatures will want to be relatively warm. Now, I'm not saying, you know, 80 degrees, but at least like maybe seven, uh, 65 to 72 would be good. Um, maybe uh, some other indoor tropical plant professionals might um, have a different opinion, but typically if I'm keeping my... Um, you know, room temperatures around that mid range, my plants seem to do all right. Plants that would require a warmer environment. Again, you'd wanna be mindful of how warm or cool your place normally stays. Space, we wanna keep in mind the space or the location that the plants are gonna go. Is it gonna be a tabletop or on top of a dresser or is it gonna be like a, a freestanding plant on the floor? This is also something to keep in mind. And then understanding how large that plant is going to grow. Pets and children. This is something else to keep in mind when we're selecting plants. And then uh, something that is 
that I've learned over the years is how much attention you have to care for the plants. So if you're someone that has a lot of time and really likes to fuss over plants, then that there are plants that are suited for that kind of attention. Whereas for myself, I can, I have learned that the best indoor house plants that uh, thrive in my environment are those that uh, really can handle neglect and a lot of it. So really the last time I watered is a while ago. I can't even remember when the last time I watered. So now I know, oh, it must be time to water. And those are the types of plants that thrive in my environment. So just being realistic of what you can, um, you know, the type of attention you can give your plants. Okay. So now uh, some things to keep in mind uh, in regards to proper care. So uh, the care needs of plants are going to maybe be a little obvious, but uh, we want to keep in mind how frequent we water our plants. Again, there is a very uh, broad spectrum, uh, a very large array of uh, needs of these types of plants. So when you're purchasing a plant and inviting a plant into your home, learn a little bit about it. Ask the fine, uh, knowledgeable staff members at your garden center, you know, what type of care these plants need. And hopefully you can really match it to what uh, your environment can offer. When we talk about watering, one of the probably one of the biggest mistakes is that we have a tendency to overwater. So what I would recommend is that we really wanna err on letting those plants dry out, less is more. And I'm not saying less in regards to volume of water. I'm, I mean, less is like frequency. So really feeling that soil and making sure that soil is able to dry out before watering again. And then how dry that soilage is we'll have to gauge. Best fertilizers for our plants are going to be those that are going to be lower, have lower nitrogen, which is that first number. When we look at a, a box or a bottle or a bag of uh, fertilizer, we have those three numbers, the NPK. The first one is N, that's nitrogen. We want to make sure that number is rather low. Now, I'm a fan of organic fertilizers. As Jen mentioned uh, at opening, that if we can feed our plants in a, um, with the best quality organic fertilizer, those plants are going to thrive. And what we found is that healthy plants uh, have a tendency to not have as many pest issues. And then understanding how frequently we need to fertilize. Oftentimes it's not as frequent uh, as we might think. Uh, I, depending on my plants, uh, typically it's only maybe about four times a year I'm fertilizing. Although I have some orchids that I will fertilize with a different schedule after they've bloomed, I'll fertilize them a little bit more frequently through like the three to four months after their blooming cycle. Oftentimes plants will, our indoor tropicals are gonna need some humidity. Uh, they, not all of them can handle the drier conditions that some of our places, uh, that, that we, you know, some of our environments are a little drier than others. So we want to provide humidity if needed. Uh, we also want to learn about how often we need to repot the plants. Uh, we also want to understand how to prune or trim plants back if they happen to get too large or kind of scraggly. And then learning about how to divide plants if needed, and then always monitoring for pest problems. So as I shared, Jen has already created a beautiful webinar that really goes through the um, just about all of these points. So please take the time to review that. I learned a lot from watching it and I imagine that you will too. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the common mistakes we make. So overwatering is going to lead to uh, root rot and diseases. Uh, fungus gnats, which are those little, uh, you know, like fruit fly things that are flying around that actually are uh, breeding in the soil. Uh, overwatering can also uh, show evidence on the plants as wilt, believe it or not. Uh, browning leaves, uh, you know, browning tips of leaves and then dieback. So that's 
when things get kind of tricky, because when we see a plant that's wilted, oftentimes we think, oh, it needs water, but that's why it's so important to actually feel the soil and make sure that soil is dry before we water it. Something else I can share, and I know I'll mention it again, we want to make sure that that plant is able to drain. Uh, we want to make sure that that pot is not sitting in water at any point. We always want to make sure it is really able to drain. So if your house plant is in a pot that does not have holes in it, uh, it might be a little bit more challenging for you to know exactly when is going to be um, the time to add more water. Something else I can share is that warm and or dry environment can lead to, lead to spider mites, as well as that wilt look and browning leaves and dieback. Uh, and then overfeeding with high nitrogen or and or synthetic fertilizers are going to lead to uh, unnatural growth spurts, which is going to attract pests. And it's also going to lead to salt buildup around the root zone, which over time is going to be quite detrimental to your plant where you'll kind of see a slow decline and you're not sure what's going on. And then something else I just wanna point out is that introducing plants that are already infected with pests is common when we're buying from the uh, discount centers. So we always wanna make sure we're buying from high quality retailers that have, uh, that have knowledgeable uh, staff such as Sloat so that you can make sure you're getting the best quality plant that isn't going to already be coming into your house with pest problems. And something else I can share is it's also important to look very closely for signs of uh, insects or mite infestations on those plants. And you might even need to go as far as to quarantine those plants. Um, you know, maybe a friend gifts you a house plant as a housewarming gift or as a, you know, a gift for another reason. You might want to just quarantine that plant until you know that that plant is free of any pest problems. And that quarantine could be uh, in an area that it could still thrive, but away from other plants. So in case it does end up having some pests, it's not going to move to the other plants. Okay, so some of the common uh, pests of indoor plants are going to include a category of uh, insects that suck nutrients from the plants. Um, this could include aphids, white flies, specifically the nymphs of the white fly, which is the juvenile or the young, um, scale insects, mealybugs, thrips, and spider mites. And what these look like can either be, uh, you know, curled leaves or leaves that have like stippling. And I've got some photos of that type of damage in a moment that I'll show you. And then the other category are going to be soil dwelling insects, such as fungus gnats, ants, sow bugs, and millipedes. Now the ants and sow bugs and millipedes are not as common. However, I have had all of those pests uh, on houseplants at some time. So that's why I'm including them. So this is a picture, and I hope I'm not grossing anyone out. I personally feel a little grossed out by some of these insects. Uh, but uh, these are all going to be kind of uh, the evidence of some of these types of insects. So aphids uh, are going, you're going to see puckering leaves. The new growth is going to be puckered. And if you open those leaves up, oftentimes you're going to see those little aphids. Mealy bugs, it looks like cottony, cushiony little um, fungus. So oftentimes mealy bugs are uh, misidentified um, until it's too late. And the thrips, uh, thrips actually create kind of this stippling or kind of silvering of the leaves. And it's very difficult to I, properly identify thrips because they look so similar to spider mites and vice versa. So that's where things start to get a little uh, difficult for proper identification. Uh, spider mites also cause that kind of silvering stippling. And I'll share something that uh, oftentimes people will see spider webs on their plants and they think they have spider mites. Spiders are also going to commonly be hanging out in house plants because they're there eating the, the pests. 
spider webs look a little different. They're actually larger. Uh, so it, it gets to be a little challenging to actually see the spider mites. And that's when we need to get a little uh, a loop or some type of a looking glass or magnifying glass so we can actually see these insects a lot closer. And then scale insects are weird. They almost look like warts or like um, lesions on the plant. And they don't really even look like insects at all. And then white flies. White flies are, are uh, the best evidence is when you actually knock the leaf of a plant and they flutter out. But if you flip that leaf over, you actually see the nymphs or the larvae stage of the uh, white flies. And those are the ones that are actually sucking the juices out of the plant, out of the leaf. They can also cause uh, curling or distorted leaves. So now that we have this up close and personal kind of look at these, we're going to go into some details. So uh, aphids. So the best way to manage aphids are to simply wipe them off. You can wipe them off with your fingers. You can wipe them off with a cloth. Uh, you can also uh, um, add sticky traps, typically yellow sticky traps because they're attracted to that yellow color. And um, they are sold as little yellow cards that have, um, you know, stickiness on them. And you can just put it on a plant stake. Oftentimes they come with plant stakes and having the sticky traps is great. I know it's not always attractive because sometimes kind of put it in the back of the plant or kind of disguise it in a way. So it's not just up front and center. However, sticky traps are awesome because they are indicators. They help us see what's going on because these, all these pests are very good at hiding. So when we have a sticky trap, it actually helps us see when there is activity. Now, uh, from there, we can use products like insecticidal soap. Insecticidal soap is going to be very low on the toxins. It's very uh, eco-friendly and um, it's very effective. And it's probably my go-to for indoor house plants because it's safe to, to use inside uh, a room or an indoor environment. Neem oil is probably going to be my number two go-to for as an indoor pesticide to use. It is uh, from the oils of a neem plant. So it is also going to be an eco-friendly um, these are registered for organic use. However, the neem oil has a little bit of a, a stronger fragrance. So if you're sensitive to fragrance or, um, you know, that type of aroma, then you might want to avoid using that. Horticultural oil is a mineral oil that is also registered, registered for organic use. It is going to also work really well. However, uh, when it comes to oils, it is really important, specifically the horticultural oil, is that when we have uh, applied it, when we've sprayed it uh, multiple times to address an aphid infestation or the scale or the thrips. It is important uh, before we apply it a fourth time to make sure we've really rinsed off that plant really well, because similar to making a candle with paraffin wax, horticultural oils, you know, like we're dipping that wick in the wax and it's building up to make a fatter and fatter candle. Well, horticultural oil will uh, build up on the tissue of the plant. And over time, if we used it maybe four or five times, it can actually clog the pores and that could be um, not so ideal for the plant. So if we're using horticultural oil, if that's our pesticide of preference, which it's great pesticide, for this application, we just want to make sure we've rinsed the plant off really well before we continue to apply it. And then we want to avoid those synthetic fertilizers, as synthetic fertilizers, especially those high in nitrogen, because they're stimulating a lot of new growth, which these insects are attracted to because they're able to get their little piercing mouth parts into that new tender uh, growth of plant tissue with ease. And that tender growth of plant tissue also has really high sugar content. So they're just like, they know exactly how to go for the gold. And then we want to ensure the health of, of the plant, making sure we've done all those steps that I, I mentioned in the slide previous, that it's the plant is in the right place. It's getting the proper light exposure. We're not overwatering it or underwatering it. And that um, it's not sitting in water and all of those things. Mealybugs. Okay. Mealybugs 
I'm sorry to say, are probably one of the most challenging pests. So when you have a house plant, I should say, if you whatever plant you have, it's so important to be involved in your plants, uh, monitor them, inspect them, check in on them. I mean, we love these plants. That's why we're inviting them into our home. But uh, I will share of all the past mealybugs might be the worst because they're so challenging to eradicate. When we see mealybugs, again, they look a little bit like a fungus, so it's not always easy to identify. But we really want to make sure that we immediately wipe off the mealybugs and clean those plants the best we can. We can clean them with insecticidal soap or neem oil or the horticultural oil. Uh, we also wanna clean the pot and the saucer because the mealybugs have a tendency to burrow into the soil and to be on the inside lip of the pot or the outside lip of the pot or to crawl down and hang out uh, under the saucer, hiding in these very strategic places so that we don't see them. Uh, we also want to avoid those synthetic fertilizers for the same reasons I mentioned, and we want to make sure we're ensuring the health of the plant. So um, this is just a huge... Uh, it, Typically with the other pests, we're going to follow the uh, instructions on how to apply the pesticide according to the pesticide label. So for instance, insecticidal soap, we'll say to reapply every five to seven days. And so if it's aphids or any of the other pests um, that we're speaking about this afternoon, typically you spray it, today's Wednesday, I'm gonna spray my plant. I'm gonna spray again next Wednesday because I can remember Wednesday and that's seven days away. And then I'm going to apply a third application the following Wednesday. So I've applied three applications within two weeks. My aphid should pretty much be done because I've been able to kill the adults, any eggs that have hatched. I've killed those adults again. And then I've killed a final round of uh, life cycle. With mealybugs, we have to apply the insecticidal soap weekly for a while um, and monitor. So I would say at least for uh, four to six weeks just to start. And then from there, you can monitor and see if there's any new outbreaks and then repeat that cycle. That's why it's a little bit more challenging because it's an endurance. We really have to be persistent with it and monitor. Scale insects, these are really common on the palms and some of the ficus. Uh, just off the top of my head. And they're easily to, they're, it's really easy to not notice them or they go undetected for a while because they just look like, I mean, they blend in really well with the uh, stalks or the rib of the leaf uh, or the frond. And um, they're kind of, I think maybe, uh, well, I'll just say they, they kind of gross me out. But the best way to manage them is just to scrape them off. And so this is another one of those pests that I just want to make sure I'm always kind of like checking in on my plants to make sure that it doesn't have scale. And even if it's just two or three little um, bumps of scale, I'm like immediately scraping it off, nipping it in the bud the best I can. I'll share something is that ants really love the secretions from scale. So we know that the ants love the secretions from aphids, but it's almost like they love the secretions of sugar. It's so sugary and sweet that they really love the scale insects. So if we see ants moving up into our house plant, they're actually telling us that there's a pest that we need to monitor. So that's going to be another indicator. Uh, and then from there, we can remove the ants and use some type of barrier, sticky barrier to prevent them from um, farming those, uh, that, those sugary secretions. And then we can also monitor and eradicate the scale insects. And we can do that with insecticidal soap, with the neem, the horticulture oil, all of those are gonna work really well. Uh, and again, we wanna avoid those high nitrogen synthetic fertilizers. And we wanna make sure that the plant is getting the best health possible. Spider mites. So spider mites increase uh, with humidity but when things are really kind of stuffy and there's not good air circulation. So, um, and actually I'd like to even say uh, when things are, oh, we want it, I'm sorry, got ahead of myself. 
spider mites, when things are really dry and dusty and there is not good air circulation, we want to uh, change that up. We want to increase the humidity. We want to mist those plants, those leaves with water. We want to open it up, prune it, uh, open it up in a way that we can increase the airflow, maybe even bring a fan into the room just to increase the airflow. We want to prune off the heavily infested areas. Um, we are going to then use the same practices of using the insecticidal soap, the horticulture oil or the neem oil. Um, I think that uh, in this case, some people prefer the neem to either insecticidal soap or horticultural oil. Um, however, all three are going to, um, spider mites will be on the label for all three. And again, we're going to avoid those synthetic fertilizers, ensure the health of the plant, but another thing I'm adding is to avoid water stresses. So a lot of times when we're overwatering plants, that brings uh, a lot of stress to that plant and they're going to be more prone to get spider mites. And then thrips. So I just wanna show you, see how this damage looks on the, these leaves? Um, it's very similar. Well, maybe it's not a good picture. The damage is very similar. So it's really, Always hard. That's why it's good to uh, bring a sample of your plant, put it in a Ziploc bag and bring it to uh, a, uh, a knowledgeable garden center like Slope so they can help you identify what's going on. But with the thrips, we're going to um, wipe off those um, the insects when we see them. A lot of times this silvering is not going to recover these you know, again, similar with the spider mites, these leaves are not gonna recover from the damage. So a lot of times we wanna just prune off the heavily infested areas, uh, again, sticky traps. And in this case with thrips, thrips really are attracted to the blue. So um, some of the sticky trap cards are yellow, one side blue on the other, and that's going to be the sticky trap card you wanna go for. And that's gonna help you monitor to see if we have eradicated all the thrips or if they've come back. And then again, treating with the insecticidal soap, it's a perfect product or neem horticulture oil. Again, avoid those synthetic fertilizers, ensure the health of the plant, avoid water stress because the thrips are going to show up if they're getting, if that plant's getting overwatered as well as underwatered. So too dry or too wet, both ends of that spectrum are going to um, cause the plant to be stressed in such a way that it tracks the thrips. And Here's a new one. We can add beneficial nematodes to the soil and beneficial nematodes, which I'll share in a moment, are microscopic worm-like organisms that feed off of soil dwelling larvae. So in thrips, at uh, part of their life cycle is um, they hatch from the egg. They have two, um, the first two uh, instars or the first two pupae are going to be feeding off of the uh, sugars from the leaf, stippling it, making it that silvering color. And then the next two uh, phases, the next two generations or instars, um, not generations, instars are larva phases are gonna drop into the soil and they're gonna feed off the soil and they're gonna emerge as an adult to start the life cycle again. So when we have um, the opportunity to break that life cycle with the beneficial nematodes, we can add those to the soil. And that's also gonna help us with our thrips management. And white flies. White flies are also really weird and also often mistaken as a fungus because they make this funny pattern. The lower picture on the lower left, this pattern is um, very common for the white flies. Um, and also um, it looks like this kind of fungal webbing on the back of the leaves. And really until we like tap the leaf or knock it and they fly away, do we see that it is indeed white flies. So again, wiping them off, uh, pruning off the heavily infested area, Working with sticky traps is going to be key. Increasing the air circulation, um, avoiding the water stress. Again, oftentimes when we're over watering is an invitation for white flies and not just over watering, but poor drainage. So those are some things to keep in mind, as well as avoiding the synthetic fertilizers, but working with insecticidal soap is perfect. Uh, 
in, co in combination with those sticky traps, because when we spray the insecticidal soap or the neem oil or the horticultural oil to the back of the leaf, those flies will fly away. So it's not going to be very easy for us to coat those insects. So when we have um, the sticky traps in as part of our management strategy, the adult flies will fly to the sticky trap and get stuck because they're attracted to the yellow sticky traps. Now we're going to talk about the soil pests or the pests of um, the pests, the soil dwelling uh, pests. So again, sorry for the pictures if they're kind of gross, but this is what we're up against is the fungus gnats or the fungus gnat larvae that live in the soil, ants that will also find their way to nest in the soil on occasion, mealy uh, millipedes and sow bugs. And hopefully millipedes and sow bugs are uh, not really, you're, you might never have that experience. Um, and maybe hopefully not ants either, but we'll talk about them. So fungus gnats, this is probably one of the most common pests of house plants. Um, hands down, I would share, um, and it's really hard to kind of get ahead of it until there is a rather large population of them. One way to ensure that you're not going to get uh, or uh, fungus gnats or a very important preventative measure is to avoid overwatering. We really want to err on letting those plants that soil dry out. Trust me, the plants can handle dry soil. And remember, a lot of times the pot or the root system is a lot deeper than where our finger can reach. So a moisture meter might also be the key or getting, um, you know, sometimes I'll use a, uh, a, a wooden stake that's rather porous that I can put into my um, soil and then I can pull it out because it's so por porous, it will show me where the watermark is, uh, how low down, the soil has dried, that can be a nice tool to also use. But um, we really wanna make sure we are not overwatering our plants because the fungus gnats uh, lay their eggs in the soil and the larvae thrive in moist soil feeding on decomposing organic matter and um, sometimes even the root systems. We can also add beneficial nematodes to the soil because the beneficial nematodes will feed off of the larvae. We can also use a pesticide called Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis or BTI. The, one of the brand names is called Mosquito Bits. So you're gonna wanna ask uh, the retailers if they have this BTI or Bacillus for fungus gnats. It is a little tiny um, granular, it's like, uh, it's like the size of like thick uh, salt, like big uh, uh, granular salt that you put like in a salt mill, kind of is about that size. And we just work it into the top, like into the soil. You'll want to read the directions. And then um, what happens is that the uh, larvae feed off of it. It's a beneficial bacteria that is not toxic and they end up killing them. It's very effective and very efficient. We can also use the yellow sticky traps. I thought this was kind of fun to see a picture of one. This came from the UCIPM website as most of these photos have come from. And here is a picture, this is so cool, of the nematodes attacking the fungus gnat larvae. So the beneficial nematodes, as you can see, are very, very tiny. Um, the larvae of the fungus gnats are already really tiny. And so these are even more tiny, but you can see right here, this was under a microscope on a slide, how effective it is. So this is really something that I can't speak uh, more about is how awesome beneficial nematodes are for our indoor house plants, as well as uh, some soil dwelling pest problems in the garden. And then ants. So I've had ants find um, my house plants and uh, nest in the house plants into the soil. 
which is, I don't know how it happens. It's totally crazy, but it's definitely something we don't want. And as I mentioned before, they also really love to farm the sugary secretions from the scale insects, as you see in these pictures. Um, first of all, we can just wipe those ants off. Uh, we can drench the soil. You know, sometimes I'll take the pot and just put it into the um, bathtub or the sink and just drench the soil, and really rinse them out uh, because they like that dry environment. When we drench the soil with water, they will scram. We could also consider changing the soil. Uh, however, I would never really go that far to change the soil unless it's a really bad infestation. Uh, sticky barriers are going to be helpful. There's products on the market, such as like a sticky insect barrier or like Tanglefoot. Um, you can ask about those products. But when I had the situation of the ants finding uh, or nesting in my house plant, I just got an ant bait station and put it on top and that took care of the problem. We can also do a nice dusting of diatomaceous earth on top of the soil, and that's also going to manage those ants quite well. Diatomaceous earth gets on the exoskeleton of the insects and it dehydrates them. We just wanna make sure we're not putting the diatomaceous earth on the plant material because it has a tendency to clog the pores and dehydrate the uh, cells. And then, other plants like the millipedes and the sow bugs, I've had the situation. It, it can be a little bit of a problem. Um, it almost seems like they're eating the decomposing organic matter of the soil and the soil almost like disappears. It's kind of weird. So I would just go ahead and change the soil. Also, you can use diatomaceous earth. These are some things to just keep in mind and then monitor and make sure we're not overwatering and keeping the plant very healthy. And then one thing I just want to throw in, because this isn't necessarily an insect, but this is a pest problem that I get asked about a lot. Uh, cats and other pets that like to kind of dig in the soil. So there are these cat mats that you can place on top of the soil to prevent them from digging. So I just wanted to throw that out there. It is an option. Barriers, so we, or any other type of barrier you might consider. Um, just that's, that's where we think when we want to avoid or prevent, uh, critters from getting into areas, we think about barriers. So when we use pesticides, so I mentioned pretty much three main pesticides, insecticidal soap, the neem, the horticultural, but then I mentioned diatomaceous earth and the, uh, the bacillus, the beneficial bacteria that the larva of the, um, fungus ants feed off of. So there's a couple different ways. So, so far there's uh, contact kills. There's also, you know, the sprays that will coat the insect. There's also the bits, those little um, bacillus, um, thergiensis, uh, israeliensis, the BTI, mosquito bits that the larva has to ingest. And then there's the diatomaceous earth that coats the exoskeleton of the insect and kills it. So there's three different modes of action that these pesticides take. So understanding what the pest is, properly identifying it will help you identify how to, what kind of actions to take, but we're always going to use the least toxic um, and eco-friendly options. Um, we're going to only use products for indoor house plants. So this is really important. If it doesn't say for indoor use, or for indoor house plants on the label, please do not use it inside the house, okay? Um, a lot of these products actually can cause resp respiratory um, problems, even if it's eco-friendly or registered for organic use. We just want to be really careful. Uh, we want to always apply the pesticide according to the label, so please take the time to read the label. And then if we are applying indoors, we want to make sure we're providing good air circulation because it's just not always healthy for us to breathe in these products. And um, we want to always wear personal protective uh, equipment. So making sure we're wearing a mask, wearing eye goggles, wearing long sleeves, uh, non-cotton gloves. We never know what kind of dermal reaction we can have. And we certainly don't want to get these products in our eyes or in, uh, we don't want to breathe them in. So if we've got fans on, we want to turn those fans off and we just want to really use caution and just spot treat. So um, keeping our plants happy and healthy, we're going to water only when needed. Uh, some plants would require a little bit more water. They might dry out a little bit more quickly, especially if they're 
flat potted into uh, clay pots. Clay pots have a tendency to dry out a little bit more quickly. Um, uh, plastic pots have a tendency to um, not dry out as quickly. Uh, and also depending uh, how close it is to things, like is it close to the air conditioning or the heater? We wanna actually make sure they're not drying out too fast from the air conditioning or the heater, things like that. Uh, we don't wanna let plants ever sit in water. So a lot of times what happens is we'll have that uh, plant that we've purchased and it's in a plastic container that drains and we'll have it sitting in a decorative, uh, like maybe a ceramic container or something that's really pretty, we want to make sure when we've watered it, it's not sitting in water, okay? Because that's really going to lead to some problems. We want to uh, wipe off or rinse off the dust from the leaves. Over time, that dust buildup actually can be really detrimental to the plant. Um, sometimes it's easy just to go ahead and put it in the bathtub and hose it off in the shower or under the sink. But Remember that these plants are somewhat sensitive to cold. So if we are um, putting these plants in the sink to hose them off or in the bathtub, let's not blast them with the cold water. Let's let that water warm up. Let's save that water, capture it in a bucket so we can water plants outside or water our house plants um, later in the afternoon or later in the day. But let's make sure we're always rinsing those plants off with uh, you know, room temperature water. Nothing too warm, but just room temperature. Uh, we want to increase the humidity uh, during the dry uh, times of the year, especially if we've got that heat on or the air conditioning on all the time. Uh, we want to keep the room temperatures comfortable. So I remember I mentioned when plants get to be in rooms that are kind of too cold, they have a tendency to, um, you know, uh, not grow as well, or the soil has a tendency to stay wet longer. So if we're in that habit of watering every Sunday, well, we might want to just make sure that soil is dry before we water. We want to feed uh, low nitrogen, ideally organic fertilizers. However, there are other uh, non-organic fertilizers on the market, such as Osmocote. Osmocote is a really great slow release fertilizer that's ideal for indoor house plants that we would uh, add, according to the label, anywhere from every three, four, or six months, depending on the type of uh, product it is. And then um, I see this a lot, uh, people like to place their indoor house plants outside. And this is something I just, um, want to share if it is um first of all indoor house plants have been indoors they've never been out in direct sunlight so they're not acclimated for direct sunlight so if we're placing it outside for any reason like maybe we need to clean the carpets or you know clean the room and we need to get everything outside make sure it's under shade the other thing even if it's a plant that thrives in full sun um, and wants to be in bright sun in the room of the house, it is not in direct sunlight. So it will, it will get sunburned. Something else I want to share is if we have to wear a sweatshirt or a jacket out, outside, if the temperatures are that cool, that house plant's not going to like being outside because it can't put a coat on. So just use some caution when we put plants outside. Um, that's all I'm going to say. And then we want to monitor for pests. It's always important, as I've shared, to monitor and really take care of these pests the minute we see them. And with humidity trays, there's something I just want to share. Humidity trays are really awesome. And I'm a huge fan of humidity trays, especially for my orchids. However, um, we want to make sure the humidity, the plant is sitting on top of the pebbles. So humidity tray, um, if you're making one yourself, you're getting a saucer, like a glazed saucer or a plastic saucer, and um, you're going to put some pebbles in it, and you're going to fill the water up just to, just to almost the top of the pebbles, and then you're going to put the plant on top of that. The plant is the pot is never sitting in the water, so the picture on the left is correct. The picture on the right is incorrect. That is just pebbles around the edge of the saucer, probably for as a decoration. But we really want to make sure that when we water and that saucer is capturing that water, that we're now draining that water out so that we are not letting those root systems just sit in water. Okay. And so for some online resources, we have the Our Water, Our World website that will help you, guide you through some common pest problems. Um, 
in and outside of the home. So check out our waterourworld.org. But the UCI PM website is really going to be a go-to. So if you have thrips or you think you have thrips, but you can't really tell if it's spider mites or thrips, go to the UCI PM website, um, go ahead and search for those insects. And that will really give you a lot more information on um, for proper identification. And then the National Pesticide Information Center is my go-to for understanding how the active ingredients of uh, certain pesticides work. Remember I was talking about those modes of action. Is it a contact kill? Is it something that the insects need to ingest? Or is it something that's gonna um, uh, get on the exoskeleton and dehydrate them? That's the kind of information that you'll learn about on the uh, National Pesticide Information Center. With that, I'd like to thank you. We can finish with your questions. Awesome, thanks so much. You covered a ton. I feel like Charlotte wants to say something. Um, but I do, I, <laughs> and yeah, no, you, just, just really quick. I just, because Suzanne mentioned the um, recordings, I just wanna say in general, so this is being recorded and this recording will be available this Friday on our website. And then all of our past classes are all archived on our website too, under the learn tab and then videos. So, okay, go ahead, Charlotte. <laughs> and <laughs> Thanks. Um, we got a few good questions in here. Um, and thank you for sharing all that information. Um, you mentioned that ants, how to deal with ants and how they like a lot of the pests that um, like houseplants but would you say that, or do ants do any damage to the plants themselves? No, the ants aren't doing any damage unless they're nesting in the soil. So if they're nesting in the soil, well, well are they really doing damage? Not necessarily, but that's just a nuisance. So they're more it's of just a nuisance. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I, I was horrified when I saw ants nesting in my house plant and I'm right next to, like on the table next to my bed. It, and they really, can like spill out. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. It was in the same thing. And it's like super gross. Yeah. yeah. The same thing it happened is. to me. And I did what you did. I, I put the a ant bait station right on the surface and it got all crazy and nasty with ants and then they were gone. So yeah. Okay. It worked perfect. It worked yeah. perfect. Um, I did I, make a uh, note in the chat, sorry, regarding ants, is that when you do use it on houseplants, um, it really only works when it's kept dry. Di mm -hmm. Sorry, diatomaceous earth only works when it's kept dry. So somewhere between when you water and when the soil needs to be watered again, that's when you apply the diatomaceous earth. Mm -hmm. And it, during that time, since we're not watering our house plants that frequently, really we could stretch it out a good seven to 10 days. If we've got an infestation, <laughs> it's okay to kind of push it a little bit further. During that time, that diatomaceous earth will really um, take care of the problem. It should really take care of the problem just fine. Um, yeah, and you brought up something too, Charlotte, right? In the chat about the, you can water, you can put the, um, what was it? Right, about the mosquito bits. So mm -hmm. Suzanne mentioned you can work them into the soil to reduce fungus gnats. I read, I believe I read on the back, the label of the mosquito bits. So you can also mix it into water in a watering can and water the soil with it. But I would say check the back of the label before you do that. Um, but I have seen that either with mosquito dunks or mosquito mm -hmm. bits, which are the same product. Yeah, or maybe with the plunks. Oh, maybe. Other, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's that's a good point. Thanks, Charlotte. Yeah. But again, always read the label. Make sure we're applying these things properly. Um, I wanted to share because there were some questions on uh, the brand names of fertilizer. I can tell the products that we carry that is organic for houseplants and the brand is Espoma. There's one brand called Espoma and it's actually, um, there's a whole, like there's orchid food and African violet food and regular houseplant food. And it's super easy because it just, it like measures it into the dosage that you need to apply to like put into your watering can. So super easy. And then I, my personal favorite is Fox Farms. I use uh, the Fox Farms organic as much as possible. Um, That's one of my favorites also. I yeah. am a big fan of the, um, well, I also use the EB Stone um, 
fish and kelp, although fish can be a little fragrant also. Mm -hmm. So if you are watering your house plants, I just dilute it a little bit more. And I just, I'm going to uh, fertilize on a day where it's really nice. So I can have my windows and doors open. So there's a nice cross breeze. Mm -hmm. So by the, you know, by the late afternoon, it doesn't, it's not as fragrant. Yeah. And that, to that point, like granular, any organic gran granular fertilizer is going to be pretty ripe. <laughs> so especially if you have, you know, animals whatsoever, oh, or dogs yeah. or cats or anything, I mean, that's going to have a ton of different guanos in it that they're <laughs> going to be attracted to. <laughs> so we would say go liquid, um, yeah. for, for house plants and dilute it out a little bit. If it seems a little strong. Mm -hmm. But something I want to point out is when we are fertilizing, we really want to be mindful that the fertilizer doesn't make it down the sink, down any drain. We really want to make sure it's just getting into the plants. Uh, when we start to put stuff into the drain, um, it could cause problems um, down, down the stream. So let's just try to always, you know, what I always have is like a bucket that I've I'm watering um, my, I'm applying the fertilizer, anything that drains out goes in my bucket. And then I'm actually just pour it on plants outside, you know, like mm -hmm. in the containers and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Charlotte, did you have anything else to add? I think we went through most of the questions. There was one about um, would organic fertilizers be considered, cause we talked about organic fertilizers and then slow release. Um, so there's, I guess there's a question about the slow release ones. Um, are the, someone read that the time release fertilizers release most of their fertilizer in the first week or two. Um, is this applicable to like Osmocote or any of the fertilizers that we would recommend? I can't speak to that as regards to Osmocote. What I, and Osmocote is the only slow release that I know. And I, uh, and I know um, just from working in the garden industry as, um, and like for the growers, uh, the Osmocote, especially that one um, that has the pink cap, I think it's Osmocote plus or something. That's actually the fertilizer that um, orchid growers use. I think it's for six months. It just, well, in the recent 10 years, it became available on the market for, you know, consumers, but that does not release all of its, you know, potency or all of the important food within just a couple of weeks. It actually is slow release. It's the slow release through that whole time. I can't really speak to any other slow release fertilizers. Um, and then something I want to add is, you know, Jen, in that uh, program that you did on um, the houseplant care, which really goes into the care of houseplants, uh, there was a question that came up about the fertilizer spikes. And you all mm. said you didn't have a lot of experience with it. Mm -hmm. I love the fertilizer spikes because there oh. are organic ones. They're super easy to use and they usually last for about six months. So I don't have to think about it. So when I can find them, I... I'll, I'll use them. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I, I don't have any experience with them. Yeah. So I just I know, it seems kind of like a weird thing, but they have the organic ones now and they mm -hmm. work really well and they're not stinky or weird. Mm -hmm. Although That's a, yeah. yeah, just with house plants, it's always a challenge, whether you're dealing with insects or watering or fertilizer, because they're in a container inside your house and you have to like put them take them somewhere usually to deal with it. So, yeah. yeah. So the easier, yeah. the better is my point. The easier yeah. you can make it easier, the better. That's why yeah. the, uh, the slow release fertilizer and the organic spikes are very easy to use. Great. Well, thanks so much, both of you. I'm, uh, this is a ton of really awesome information and, um, really appreciate your time and expertise. Like I said before, this is being recorded and the recording will be up on our website on Friday, which I think is the 18th. Um, and on, and it's also on our YouTube channel. So if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will get a notification when the recording is available. 
the advantage to through our website, I don't think it's on the YouTube, but through our website is that the outline is the outline link is underneath the recording. So if you need need that to reference, you, you can just uh, go there for the outline. So thanks again. I hope everyone has a really nice rest of your Wednesday evening and hope to see you at the next class this weekend on weeds. How to take care of weeds. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Thanks, Jen. Really appreciate Thank it. You, Thanks, Charlotte. Charlotte. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Yeah.